that's super fast, really. And we're all acknowledging that it's super fast, dangerous and <laughs> fast. Um, but I say five to seven years is pretty far for the course. We're talking about how long, how long it takes to get from an idea to production. Uh, this is Grant Codis, who I just want to say really quickly, uh, is the Tony Award winning book writer and lyricist of Urinetown. He's worked as a member of the experimental leader group, the Neo Futurists, and his other projects include Pig Farm and Yeast Nation. One of his new musicals that he's working on at the moment is ZM, which is a show about zombies with his Urinetown collaborator, Mark Hallman. Um, so that is an introduction for Greg. Yay! Yeah. Yeah. How much perseverance you obviously need to have because now that you guys are all sharing your stories it's really it's a long trek from inception to stage um, yeah it is i'm on this panel representing sort of a different side of the, the creative equation i'm a producer and manager um, so in a producing capacity just to give a little sense of why it takes so long um, amanda alluded to it but i'm currently producing a project that's in its third year of development which uh, my producing partner on it is the president of Washington Square Films, who really oversees a lot of our independent filmmaking. And it has been absolutely torturous for him, because in the independent film world, you have a script, you have the money, you go. So literally, we are in pre-production for a movie that last week wasn't happening, but it's going to start in July. So that's the time frame that he's working with, and he just simply doesn't understand our universe. Um, but this particular project that we're working on, it started with an idea. It's based on existing source material. So there was a, a long courtship process. I'm not sure what your experiences were, Amanda, with underlying material. Frequently, this is their family's legacy or this person's legacy. So there's a lot of trust that has to be um, go into the process. I mean, we're going to turn this particular project over these, to these particular people. So once that happens, then it gets turned over to the lawyers. And lawyers frequently are paid by the hour, so it's in their best interest to make the process as long as possible. Um, so then, then sort of throughout, you begin to sort of conceptualize and brainstorm in terms of who are the collaborators going to be. Then it's a process of speaking with the agencies in terms of getting their ideas, et cetera, then meeting with writers, then coming up with short lists, and then agreeing, and then it gets turned back over to the lawyers. Um, and so then, sort of throughout these stages then, then you're getting an outline, a treatment, a script, a notes, et cetera, et cetera. And then you begin having conversations with regard to uh, producing partners, whether you're gonna be doing a regional theater um, tryout, which is the typical route these days. Um, and then you become sort of beholden to their schedule and their calendar. They're frequently working anywhere from 18 to 24 months out in terms of their planning process. So you can be having a conversation right now on July or June 24th, and the theater with whom you're having a conversation can't begin to even contemplate producing your show either in an enhanced production situation or otherwise until at the very earliest September of 2018. So it's not through anybody's interest, desire, or passion to, to move the process forward. Sometimes it just takes time. Does anyone else want to speak to, yeah? Um, so I can speak to the more early career side of it. Um, so when you're, when you're starting out as a musical theater writer, um, pretty much, um, and things like uh, the, solo, the cabaret shows that Jennifer mentioned earlier are really helpful with this. You're shooting flares out into the universe because you don't know what flares can be seen and take. And so my first professional <coughs> musical production kind of came as the result of shooting out a flare. I had done a, a song series with one composer at uh, this New York cabaret venue called New York Theater Barn. And it so happened that someone was in the house who was friend with someone else who was looking for applications to a reading series at a regional theater upstate. And that, that uh, reading series was desperate for someone because one of their people had dropped out to do a, um, the Johnny Mercer songwriters workshop. And so I got connected to them, I submitted a musical we had in progress, and they brought us into their reading series. And then because of that reading series, they, they liked it and they offered us a full production the following summer. So that was something that never really happens in that we started writing the show in, I think, September 2012. And then by summer of 2014, we had a full professional production. Um, so that, that's kind of the, the beginner's luck aspect of it. They're like, wow, this is awesome, this happened. Um, but the, the process that I'm much more familiar with is you write something, you do a reading, you wait for a theater to sit on it, option it for a while, 
And then it just, as, um, as we mentioned, you have to wait for a bunch of people's schedules to align, so these things can take a long, long time. But when the stars do align correctly, um, as uh, George mentioned for her, her recent commission, um, it is a beautiful and wondrous thing. And that's ultimately what theater is about, writing something, seeing it in front of an audience, and revising it. So when it does happen quickly, it, it makes my soul happy, and I wish that would happen more often in theater, so that writers could learn and grow, because you grow by seeing your work in front of an audience. Uh, I wanted to ask, oh, Greg, do you want to speak to that as well? Oh, uh, what are we talking about? <laughs> <laughs> um, if you want to speak about a specific musical or project you worked on and how long it took from inception oh. to the stage. <clears throat> and uh, into the mic because it's being live streamed also. Uh, yeah. Excellent. Um, <clears throat> yeah, I mean, there's there are um, there are two projects that I'm working on now that maybe uh, are two different versions of how something can happen. One is a um, very producer-driven project, which is a musical version of the 1970s film, The Sting. Um, so this is, for certain generations, this is a really beloved film, and it's a, it's a story about um, con men. And so the, the great thing about being uh, hired, essentially, by a producer is that the producer is going to be the engine which drives it forward, which brings people together, which creates a timetable, a, a, a Creative development timetable, and also when the time is right, they um, will find hopefully a theater where you can try out of town, and maybe that comes into New York if the show is good enough and you've done your work well enough. I guess the, the tricky thing is to get yourself in a position where a producer is going to hire you to do that. So that's sort of like the the big question. So it's, it feels very luxurious to be in that position where you are either commissioned or a producer's behind you, and you can really concentrate on the creative stuff. The other model, which I'm much more familiar with, is you have an idea, you think it's great, you write it, you get someone to write, to write the music, and then you just kind of knock on doors and um, make phone calls and send emails forever. Um, there's a project that we've been working on since uh, we had our first draft, I want to say, in 2001, um, and that it has had success, success productions uh, but has not really gotten to a commercial place. And I haven't given up on it either. So that's another model. Um, and uh, in a healthy career, I think you get to have both. You get people calling you and saying, hey, you're the person I want to write the book for, um, you know, I don't know, uh, uh, Mission Impossible. You, you have to do it. <laughs> And then that will pay your way for a while. And then while you're writing Mission Impossible, then you get to write the, uh, you know, the, st the history of Quirk musical. <laughs> <laughs> and feel has to happen. So, and I'm, yeah, Quirk. <laughs> <laughs> so I, um, I, I feel lucky to do the producer stuff, and I feel really passionate about the Quirk musical that I think will be. So. Uh, in contemplating this topic, I was reminded that curtains actually took more than 20 years to get produced, and obviously there's a lot of stories like that. So you guys are all professional perseverers as well as writers. That's what <laughs> yeah. That is necessary. <laughs> necessary skill to be part of this, and it is good as as Greg was saying to uh, have a, a couple of things on the boil because there's always fallow times. You know, if you have one thing and you're obsessed with it. It, you become a little dangerous to, to yourself and others and your family members. Uh, it's, it really is good to have a couple of things, and it's great, uh, as Greg said, to have things that, that uh, you're asked to do and things that you must do. You know, um, they each have their own rewards. Mm -hmm. and what makes each of you drawn to a specific topic or source when you first, you know, get that spark and start writing it or take the job or, you know, write the spec songs? Um, and also, do you feel like that's changed at all since you started writing about what material you're, you're drawn to? I know that was probably a question, <laughs> uh, directed to the creatives, but um, from my perspective, um, I'm looking at material or drawn to material based on its potential. Um, and that is sort of a shifting landscape in terms of um, where you think it can head. I mean, the reality, particularly for musical theater, um, versus plays or plays for young audiences, is that the reality of the long-term success for a musical 
is in some ways dependent upon its ability to have a Broadway run. Um, that's just sort of the reality. Um, so in evaluating projects, you begin to look at um, what the potential is for a Broadway engagement. You begin thinking about it, I begin thinking about it from the perspective of, you know, what's the message, what's the brand, how can I communicate the message, what is the landscape looking like right now, and 18 to 24 to 36 months out because that's how long it's going to take. And is there a universality in terms of the story that's being told? Is there, is it necessary? Is it needed? Is it now? Now being 36 months from now. <laughs> but also the reality, not just in terms of audiences, but also in terms of investment. Because, you know, you're thinking about a project that in a regional theater enhanced production is you're gonna to need to come up with at least a million to two million dollars. Are you going to be able to, to raise that money based on a hope, a promise, an idea? And then if you're getting into a commercial landscape and a musical, it's a minimum of $10 million. So not only do you need to evaluate whether you can speak to an audience, but importantly, can you speak to a high net worth individual who's going to write you a check for multiple, multiple sums? I think on, on the creative side, there's like, Using the history of Cork example. Um, I want to see this now. Yeah. Right. <laughs> I mean, I, it's story that's all. <laughs> <laughs> Thank you. <laughs> We're right on step two. Okay. <laughs> okay. Um, well, I just, I just, from the creative side, I think there has to be just um, maybe even an, an, Amanda, you're saying that you, you can be dangerous to yourself, which I agree. Um, but I do think there needs to be um, just a real fierce passion for the thing. Um, I found that writing, I'm a Loretta's, and writing books, at first the experience is like, oh, this is easy, I'm gonna get, this is gonna be done in two weeks, fantastic. And then you find out that it actually takes years and years. Um, and you know, the timetables, even five or seven years is, you know, there's no guarantee of that. That's short in some ways. Um, and so I think just to take your own temperature about your passion about this project and because you can't really, you don't know who else is going to be passionate about it. So you have to be passionate about it first, talking about the playwrights, and then the composers, hopefully in that marriage, in that partnership, there's passion there. So I think just there needs to be just a, fierce, a fierceness about it if you're, if you're the one behind it, I would say. Um, you've talked about some of, you've each talked about some of the ways that your productivity and creativity are benefited from having multiple projects at the same time or from, you know, applying for a commission. Um, what are things that you've learned since you started as a producer or as a writer that have kind of kept these projects alive in you and helped you to write them over this long period of time? Is there anything else um, that you would tell other writers has been helpful? I think um, for me, the all the little places along the way where you get to perform your like one song at an event or or you know you apply for a festival and you can do thirty minutes of your show or something like that are are super important. Not I used to think they were important in letting other people know what you were working on, and now I'm starting to have second thoughts about exposing your material too early so that three or four years later when it's finally ready, people feel like it's been around forever <laughs> instead of it being fresh. But what I find invigorating about that process is anytime I give a piece of music to a singer and say, can we work on this? Can I hear it in your voice? Oh, maybe we need to try another key. Oh, that, that, that's a mouthful of words that come, I didn't expect that. You know, that you learn so much about your piece just by having the experience of, of getting it out of your piano or your computer or your brain and, and getting it into the place where it lives in another human being. And so I, I have started looking for more and more opportunities to do that. You know, even if it's just, now I have some friends who are really great performers, and allowing the time to say, will you come over and I can buy you lunch and you'll sing me songs for me, um, as a way to just make it real. And because I think, I think, I sat in a meeting with a publisher recently who said, he, would, he, I, he really wasn't meaning to offend me, but he said, if your music only exists on your hard drive, it doesn't really exist. And, and it's so true, you know, it does exist. It exists in my head and then I write it down and then it's on my computer, but it doesn't exist until it, it lives in someone else. And that's why I think process and production become two very equal, equally important, but very different 
steps that it, I have spent a lot of time thinking, I write music and my job is to get it on paper. But it's not true, my job is to make that music come to life. And so that's where the, the more you can learn about production and the more you can make your own opportunities, the more chance you'll have to learn about your piece. I've also just in terms of, uh, not really commercial, but choose your collaborators wisely. <laughs> and choose people who you really get a kick out of being with. I mean, I saw, it's not always true. I, I, I haven't like, you know, become best friends with everybody I've worked with. I've become best friends with some people I've worked with. But there's something about them that I just think, God, that, God, that guy's smart. God, that woman's got something. <laughs> like, you know, or you, they make you laugh. Or when you're fresh out of ideas and hope, they're like, come on, we can do it. You know, I mean, that's, that's the good thing about doing a musical, and, and if you have collaborators, is that you don't always have to be driving the train, because uh, you get tired, you can pass the baton, you know? Uh, and, uh, and be with people who you're like, it's fun to be with, because the process is sometimes all you get, you know? And, uh, but it's not a waste of time if you spend that time writing and being with people who get you excited and who share your passion and uh, you know hope I mean the, be it, the best is that you it, it has productions and a long life and it makes you buckets of money but uh, it's great if you um, if you really love what you do and, and are excited to spend the day with those people and I think also just speaking to everybody's point here um, you know what Georgia was talking about with regard to those moments where you get to have the work performed and Greg speaking to the passion and then speaking to other representatives in the room, we're all on a daily quest for small victories. Um, whether it's a script that you send out to somebody that somebody responds to, because sometimes you're sending these things out into sort of a black hole void and you're not really expecting anything back. So when you do get a pain back, it feels good. And those, those moments also in the creative process or in the producing process, it's very intimate and it's very, you're very passionate about it, but at a certain point you begin to need to sort of open up the clamshell a little bit. And then you have those moments of self-doubt where you're like, is this a good idea? <laughs> and then you have a conversation with somebody or somebody sings the music or takes a look at it or hears what you have to say about it, and they're like, it's a good idea, keep going. And so you do. I keep thinking about what Greg said about sending up flares, that that's what you said too about sending your script out into the ether. In, in a way, it is sending up flares. And um, and I, I love that image because I think we all do that at, at the beginning, at every level of the way. And, um, and I think it's important to know that we're all doing that. One of the first one of the first big things I did is I made I, I made an album and I paid for it myself and I did and I didn't have a label and I didn't have anything and I did it and the reason I'm mentioning that is because like this morning Andy was talking about his podcast as a calling card and that's what I've said about it like yes I sold it but I would say now in the 15 years since I made it it's maybe paid for itself like it's not like I made a profit from it but it took my career from here to here and I would go to you know, industry events and, and people knew that I was a songwriter, even if they hadn't heard it, they, it, wasn't, it wasn't me saying, I, this is what I do desperately, hoping that you were paying attention and knowing what category to put me in. But instead they, they knew me and because I had good singers on the album, it lent a validity to the work. And there was just a lot of that that felt like an investment in my career that I was making. Um, you know, and I think, one of the things that I want to talk about, I almost asked you this question when you were talking about 54 Below, but I think one of the things I continue to evaluate is what is the good money to spend and what is the bad money to spend? And I think that money for me was the best money I ever spent on my career, was making my album. I don't think everyone should make an album. I don't think that I'm saying we should all now go make albums. But figure out, I think your podcast is probably a really good investment, just hearing you talk about it. you know. This morning we were talking about this podcast and I said, does it cost you money and do you make money? And the answer was, yes, it costs money and no, I don't make money. But I think that's true of my album too, that in a way that was the flair that I sent up. But it was the thing that led me to having other people see me as a person who might be able to do this kind of work and led to other kinds of offers coming in. I'm not sure I would do it again the same way. I'm not sure I would have the same return on investment that it did then. But I am looking at what what is the thing I should be putting my money into now that yields that kind of return. Yeah. I was listening to that album on the plane ride here, sitting a seat away from Georgia. She doesn't know that. It's really great. That was while I was tweeting at you. So clearly, really great. the place to put your money, what I have done in the past, is lawyers' fees before you have a deal. 
Uh, I did it like I was trying to get the rights for something. I hired the best lawyer. What? I mean, it, was, it, was, it was a waste of my money. And, um, you know, I've had people who are collaborating on something and nothing has happened yet, and they're arguing about percentage points of nothing. And, and they have feuds, and they have drama, and they have lawyers, and I was like, that is a waste of money. So don't, put, don't waste your money. Uh, if you if you're become a member of the Drama Guild, and if you have a legal question, you can call and talk to somebody, and it won't cost you a penny. Do not spend your money on lawyers. <laughs> Sorry, if there's any lawyers in the house, no, don't, don't do it, don't do it. Yeah, unless they're negotiating a, a contract for you. In that case, do not negotiate it yourself. <laughs> Uh, Andy and Greg, I know that we talked about how choosing a collaborator is such an important, obviously, step in this process. Do you want to talk about how you guys started collaborating and what your process together is like? I'll, uh, I'll start this one off. Um, so I am, uh, I, I have worked with a lot of collaborators, uh, not just on the podcast, but also in the BMI workshop that, and you did that, right? Mm -hmm. Yeah, and uh, George, you have been there. Uh, but Greg has done it. Though I actually met Greg originally, <laughs> when I was a music director for this thing called Eight Men Musicals. And uh, Greg was one of the writers. And uh, it was one of those uh, moments where, it was one of those just kind of festivals where the writers had a weekend to write it, and then the actors had a week to learn it, and then Friday there was a show. And um, in that, it was a weekend to write it, but it was Friday night, they found out who their collaborator was, and then Sunday they was the read through. Um, and I was the music director of four of them, and the first three ranged from pretty bad to okay. And then Greg came in with his collaborator, Kate. Amanda, that's it. Uh, and uh, it was this stunningly perfect little gem that I still don't know how it's possible to write this tight, hilarious, heartfelt eight-minute musical in a day. Um, and it was in the Sam French Festival, how long ago? I think like five years ago. Five years ago or so, so it got accepted into that festival then. Um, so I always remembered, like, oh yeah, the Greg Edwards is so damn smart. And then we were both in the BMI workshop. But why I also bring up the BMI workshop is that your first year um, in the workshop is spent, uh, they give you assignments to write a song a month or so, and they pair you up with a different collaborator for each one. So I've worked, that first year you worked with like how many, 10 or so, something like that, 10 collaborators. And some of them I uh, can't ever talk to again. And some of them are lifelong partners and friendships and all that. Um, and it's been kind of similar with the podcast, where it, there have been maybe 10 different writers with me, something like that. Uh, and Greg and I have written two together. And it's just been a lot of fun, you know, kind of planning to write a full length together as well. Um, and I forgot how the question started. That's a good answer. No, just if you want to talk about how you collaborate when you're, you know, in the same room or when you're working on a specific project, how did you write? Um, so, I, so to riff off of what Andy said, um, I think like a, a collaborator, um, Amanda mentioned that sometimes you end up best friends and sometimes you don't. Um, for me, I, I think like Andy and I like have a fairly like bare knuckles method of collaboration in that like yeah. we, we get along, uh, <laughs> we both have like a distinct lack of strangulation marks on our neck. Um, but at the same at the same time, like we're not afraid to like we both have strong ideas and we both fight for them, and and it's I think it also to helps to uh, look at us talking together and Mike's looking at each other we're like we're laughing. <laughs> <laughs> I was going to also say that um, part of the trouble, part part of the difficulty with collaborating is when you critique each other's work as it's in the middle of being written, which is tough for everybody. And I've definitely learned a lot in how to give my advice thoughts rather on, um, you know, if a lyricist puts me a lyric and I say this doesn't make sense, I gotta back it up. And I think Greg and I each understand that and our, uh, we back up our criticisms of each other, criticism not the right word, our thoughts and feedback. reactions and feedback. Like, agreeing with everything the other person does isn't, isn't helpful to either the collaboration or the work. So it's kind of the combination of being a, a decent human being slash getting the most you can out of the work, slash, like, be looking forward to talking to the person the next time. Yeah. Um, and when, when you achieve those three things, it, it's great. And when you don't, it's, I guess, what, like a, a Princess Bride adaptation. Uh, yeah. <laughs> Hello, live stream. <laughs> <laughs>
I was just going to say that sounds like my marriage. <laughs> I mean, literally. It's, it's very funny how relationship esque collaboration is, and how much of it is saying you're sorry and willing to change, but also holding your ground and having you know, that back and forth balance of self doubt and, uh, and willing to raise the other person up to the level. <laughs> In terms of actual collaboration methods, I mean, I'm sure everyone up here has uh, different techniques they use. And for me, I mean, there's, I, I worked with a bunch of different composers, and it's never been a one-size-fits-all solution. Um, so, I mean, you, you find, um, Georgia in her uh, seminar earlier today was mentioning the importance of finding a language with um, each collaborator. And so every collaborator does have a distinct language, and sometimes you find it by trial and error. Um, and sometimes you just happen to lock into it immediately. And then once you find it, you speak in that language. And I think that's why um, so many successful collaborators stick together for such a long time, because they have this um, unique way of talking that gets um, directly to the point, and that may be something only they too can understand, but they're the only ones who need to. Um, I'm glad that Georgia brought up the, the question of how to spend your money as a writer in ways that are going to benefit you, because I have a question about that for you know everybody, uh, producers and writers' perspective, of YouTube and how um, kind of YouTube functions in this world. I've been surprised in my position on um, how much someone who's looking to hire someone for a, a professional job, an actor or a writer, will kind of look at YouTube as a source, as one of the sources in you know figuring out if they should hire this person or not, um, which obviously has pros and cons, and then it's a conversation we have at 54 Below a lot where I'm like, you know, 140 people see this and if you film it, you know, millions of people can see it. So I'm curious what all of your perspectives are on like the pros and cons of YouTube and how that's used in your careers and in musical theater today. I'll jump on this one first. The, um, I think it, it actually echoes some of the things we brought up in the copyright conversation before this, which is, I think it's the creator's choice. You know, if, I, if I'm putting an evening on at 54 Below and I hire a videographer and get permission from all the performers, which you must do, you must make the performers either sign a release or give you some sort of verbal you know, um, agreement that it's okay, um, including the musicians, uh, then, then we're creating something knowing that we're creating it for more than 140 people. And, and, and actually, like the Big Red Sun concert that we did as part of uh, the Festival of New Musicals, Part of the reason I wanted to do it is because we didn't have any of the content from that show on YouTube, and I thought there are really there are people who will type in Big Red Sun, Georgia Stitt, and nothing will come up. And I was like, I want to change that so people can find it. And so my investment in that evening was actually an investment in it's, it's cheaper than making demos. You know, it's it's a good way, to, and 140 people will see it live, and there's an energy of the live performance. But to me, that was part of the product that I was making. Um, my friend Julia Marty was uh, Alphaba on Wicked, and she talks about how frustrating it was to be a performer in Wicked, and she would get up to um, the end of the first act, and she would be in the wings, ready to come out and, um, and perform, and she said, as she walked down the stage, she would see all the lights in the audience go on, all the cell phone lights come on, and she thought, I'm not allowed to make a mistake tonight in this performance, I'm not allowed to have, so I'm gonna go into my, I'm performing for, for posterity mode, and I'm not gonna allow myself to react in a live theater way to whatever someone else shows me, because some girl in Australia might be searching on YouTube and this is the video she watches. And if I do something that's a little bit real or a little bit in the moment, it might, it might be too much of a risk and my voice might crack or might something, so I'm not gonna take that risk. I'm just gonna do, I'm gonna do the show for YouTube. And she was frustrated that her experience as a performer was changed because it was being archived without her permission. And I never stopped thinking about that as um, that, you know, I've had interviewers say, I'm gonna just film, or may I film your concert and then show some of it, you know, after the fact. And I say, no, I'm filming it. You can license the, or, or even ask for, not necessarily even pay. You can use my official video that all the performers have signed off on and I've signed off on. But if we go up on our lyrics in the middle of a show, in the middle of a song, I don't wanna worry that that's what you're gonna put in your review. So it's about control, but, but it is, I'm making something, and so I do have that control. Yeah, to the point of control, um, YouTube is a tool, as is Twitter, as is Facebook, Vimeo, Vine, other things that I'm too old to really know about. Um, but it's really, 
you know, from my perspective about being able to control the brand and control the message and the way in which it's being disseminated. Um, and everyone is hopeful for those viral moments, which you can't script, which is the point of them being a viral moment. Um, but they also need to be part of a larger plan. Um, you know, Georgia spoke very eloquently with regard to her first album and, you know, didn't just record Big Red Sun because there's a sort of specific idea and thought process behind it. With projects that I'm involved with as well, I would like to think that I, sort of overseeing the project in its totality, have sort of a, a long view vision of how these things can, can sort of um, propel you forward in directions you want to go. I think the danger sometimes is when those become distractions. Okay, I'm going to open it up a little bit for more questions. Um, does anyone have a question they want to ask? Don't be shy. Um, <laughs> so, my question that I, I was just jotting down some thoughts. Um, is that there's a mentality in theater um, that you can't make money at this. And I'm just like in this inquiry about this mentality. And I don't, it, it's, it seems like it's been proven and a lot of people get disappointed and, and, and so rejected that they can't pull themselves together anymore to do another show. And so theater has this reputation of um, you just can't make money at it. And even if you're doing a show, you should put the money in anyway, even if you don't make money at it. And I just think that's preposterous. I really do. Um, because, and it, it happens, but I think part of the reason why it happens is because people have this mentality of that is going to happen um, as you're going through the process. So I, I think a shift in the mentality that you can make money at this um, needs to be like reinforced. And it, it's like I'm almost like requesting now a panel <laughs> in this conversation of, of how can we create an environment of yes, you can make money at this and do it without compromising, you know, artist, artistically. That's that's the that's the hard part. Do you know the phrase, the, the very famous line in musical theater, you can't make a living, but you can make a killing? Yeah. yeah. Right. Yeah. Uh, I more people that, to laugh at that. <laughs> <laughs> also, yeah, and the reason uh, uh, I'm on the Drama to Skill Council, and the reason why, one of the reasons I think that's so important is, is it, it, it um, is a safeguard against eroding the rights of writers. Um, uh, there was a thing, I mean, Hamilton is a show that is the exact opposite of your thing. It's making a fortune, it's, it's this phenomenon. But this little, this middle uh, school did a, an unauthorized production of it, and it was fabulous, and it was up on YouTube, and people were like, they, and they, they shut it down. I was like, outraged, how dare you, they're so good. And the school was like, you should let us do it because we're so good. And, the, and, uh, and the, the point is, no, you shouldn't do it because the right of an author, authors, don't have unions, we don't have theater writers, we don't have unions, we don't have healthcare, but we own our work. So what, if, if your show is done, you can make money. Absolutely, it's very difficult, but of course you can. And, uh, but you get paid if a school, a school has to license your show and do it. They can't just do it because they're excellent. You know? and, and by the way, of course, I'm, I, it is incredible that that show has inspired so many people, and it will for years and years to come, but it wasn't their decision to make or whether they could do it or not. So. Uh, being a member of the Drama Skill Council and, and making sure we hold on to those rights and, and, and get more rights for ourselves, because we are a unique brand, so. Yeah, I don't think anyone would disagree with you in this room that it would be terrific if those, that, those of us who are theater practitioners could have a much more steady and stable income source. But there is what makes our art form unique is also, in some ways, its limitations. Um, when The Lion King burst onto the scene in 1997, they did not have the opportunity to then go wide immediately as a film would do. They can't, they can't all of a sudden go from 3,500 screens to 6,000 screens. They're limited to 2,100 seats eight times a week. And then from there, that's, that's the top that you can make. Hamilton has broken that mold. 
but it trickles down from there. We are limited, and what's great about what it is that we do is that it's live, and it can only be done if there are multiple companies happening simultaneously, that's great, but you're limited to eight performances a week, 149 seats, $29 a ticket, because that's what the market is gonna bear. And then from there, you begin to back out how much it costs you to do it, and then what's left for the creatives is sort of what you're left to. So I don't think anybody, again, in this room disagrees. It's just the, the sort of reality of the, the world in which we live. I think it's, um, I'm interested, Beth Blickers is gonna host a talk later, it's later today, right? The, um, about other sources. That they're, that, oh, it's next, okay, good. I'll be there. Um, but the, the idea that there, if you think about what your skill set is, that there are other ways to make money to support the fact that you're writing theater. It, it, commercial theater is a very specific thing, and a, there are only a few theaters on Broadway. There's limited real estate. Everybody who does this will, is competing for those spots. So commercial theater is where you can make the big bucks. Everything else is we're doing it for art and passion, and we're doing it um, hope, hoping to make ends meet, and we're applying for grants, and there are lots of ways to do it, but nobody's expecting to get rich off their off-Broadway show that played in a not-for-profit theater. Uh, we're, we're putting content out in the world, but, but commercial theater, you can actually really, really, really make a lot of money if you do that. But I think the thing that I'm interested to hear about later today is that as a person who writes music and knows how to write for orchestras and, um, and writes lyrics, I think there are all kinds of other things that I can do that are not too far with, outside of the realm of what I do, like writing for industrials, writing for television commercials, writing, I just got asked to submit a song for a Disney animated children's TV show, and um, there are different things like that that you can do that are, that are still under the umbrella of musical theater writer, but are not actually writing for a live theater. And so I think your relationship with yourself over the course of your lifetime is, where is my sellout line? Like, is that all part of something that feels like I'm, I'm being an artist using my skill set? Or at, at a certain point you say, I just wrote a bra commercial, I'm totally sold out. You know, what is, <laughs> where is totally the right bra commercial? <laughs> I, know, not feel like I mean, this is, I, I try not to talk about it too much, but my husband wrote a bra commercial, and he wrote it, and then the following year they asked for a follow-up, so he wrote another, and those two paychecks were the biggest paychecks we got. We, I didn't have anything to do with that. I mean, I have a bra, but the, uh, <laughs> <laughs> but, <laughs> but, but in a way, that sort of allowed him the time to write the other things that nobody was, nobody was giving him a weekly paycheck to write the shows that he was writing. So, so there are interesting other ways to look for supplemental income without having to totally compromise what it is for doing for the and theater does pay, not just Broadway, but it's all over the country, it's all over the world. So there are other ways to make money in theater that is not New York and Broadway. And children's theater pays, and lots of people need theater, and content, and songs, and stories. So there are ways to make money. Hey, go ahead. Um, I, I guess I'll take a more bifurcated approach in terms of I have my skill set I use as a lyricist and librettist, but I don't really translate that skill set into freelance work or try to make my living that way. And I think for me, my justification there is I prefer um, theater writing to be the thing that I love doing as opposed to the thing that I have to do, do tasks related to it that I don't like in order to scrape by survival living. Um, so my method is in college, I study both theater and computer science, <coughs> and it turns out one of those pays. Um, so I, I day job in tech, and ever since I've graduated in college, I've uh, day job in technical roles, and it's, it's been very useful in terms of like, it's, it's a relatively low stress job, I can go in and um, put in my eight hours, and before and after I have my brain back to do theater, and I don't have to worry about it because like a paycheck's coming from a corporation, and to just have that, the security there, it frees me up creatively. Um, admittedly, like, I have to wake up like, very early in the morning to like, squeeze in writing hours before I head to the office. Um, but for me, it's the, it's the sacrifice I make as my theater income like, sneaks up and up more. Right now, I'm at a level where I could support myself if I lived in Paraguay. Um, <laughs> <laughs> I, I trust Paraguay does not have access to live stream. So. Um, and yeah, and until then, um, yeah, uh, when you use Google searches, think of me. <laughs> Are there any avenues that uh, take you as a writer directly to licensing? So, for example, the MTIs and you know that type of work. Right now, I know that schools and community theaters they're all looking for work, and then you end up, sorry, live stream, seeing Fiddler eighteen times 
you know, in your city because there's only so much work out there. Is there anyone looking into or expanding the idea of creating work that goes sort of a straight to DVD model? You know, like it's the old straight to video model where you would write shows that are just for that. Amy, give the mic to Casey. <laughs> yeah, sorry. So, from the same French. Again, hi guys. Um, so, there are a lots of different avenues, and there are actually in uh, something that we're working on at Samuel French is opening up a platform for people to self license. Um, and it's actually very far down the stream. Um, there's another great platform that just launched um, a year and a half ago called, called NPX, the New Play Exchange. So, you can Put your stuff up on there and hopefully people can come along and license it. It really, it's not as far out there as it seems to get your own stuff licensed. Um, and just like as a person, for publishing, for the licensing house, for those big licensing yeah. houses, that is kind of the end of the line of your work. So if you're ready for your work, if you're like, this is it, this is it, it's done, it's finished, I'm ready, here you go, then you can bring it to us and we can see what we can do with it and that's kind of Kind of, you can't. We really don't want you to develop it anymore. That's kind of, you know, you can change some things and stuff like that. But yeah, so that's what I would recommend. But there are platforms out there for you to put your stuff out on. Um, I just want to say really quickly, we're all, you know, artists in this room, but we're all also audience members. And whenever I hear that question, it's like a reminder to me that when there is a production of Fiddler going on down the block, and there's also a new musical, like go see the new musical and like spend your ticket dollars to go see something you haven't heard of before. Because the way that more of these shows get licensed that aren't the ten shows we've heard of before are if these like Samuel French properties see that people are buying tickets to them and they're getting licensed more and more. So like we all have that power in our pocketbooks. Or go see both because Fiddler is also great. Sure. <laughs> But like, go see the new stuff. <coughs> of 
the story and of the characters, and to know that it's up to you to communicate and to be in conversation with the songwriters about, in this moment in the story, this character is heartbroken. This is why the music, in the, I think the music in this moment needs to express that part of what she's feeling. So, and if it feels, I mean, I've been in that place too, where it feels like, oh, geez, I don't, I don't know what they're talking about. They're talking about staffs and clefts and things. And, um, but there is, yeah, it's a really, it's, it's a critical, crucial um, um, role. So, uh, and it might have something to do with something, something else. And also, it, I mean, you, you, I mean, it's, you have as much aesthetic say as they do. So if, if they're like, this song is fab fabulous, and it's like just, as Greg was saying, rubs you the wrong way for the moment, we'd say, it doesn't feel right. Or I don't hear those words coming out of that character. Also, the truth of the writer, the book writer, is that they're the most essential and least recognized, and it's the least glamorous role. So don't know that that's going to be the case. You know what I mean? Like this. It's a musical, so composers are the most visible, then lyricists, then book writers. You know, so I mean, that's just kind of the, the nature of the beast. It doesn't mean you're less important, but it's just sort of the, mo the least showy of the three, <laughs> but no less essential or more easy. It's not certainly not easier. Uh, yeah, and <laughs> um, it's it's a fine. This is your first musical that you've yeah. so. And uh, are you? Do you consider yourself knowledgeable about the musical theater world, or like do you like yeah? Music? yeah. Um, you, in a sense, you are the third wheel, but it's a third wheel of a tricycle where you. <laughs> but in the sense that you're going to feel less important, and the composer feels less important and the lyricist feels less important. Each of you has to have that humility and to, to say, I am part of something larger. And I was thinking about uh, kind of how Sondheim talks about the difference between lyrics and poetry, where the main difference is lyrics have that part missing that requires music. You know, so he points out, oh, what a beautiful morning, oh, what a beautiful day, I got a beautiful feeling, what a beautiful, uh, everything's, everything's going my way. Which by itself is like, it's fine, yeah, it's cute. But then when you have that music, it's just transcendent, you know? So your book is going to get chopped up and you're going to see them ruin it and you got to hold your ground too. But also, it's that bigger picture part of it that by giving up, by sacrificing your ego in this, and not to say you're egotistical or anybody, but for each part of, it, of this process, for each of you to sacrifice that part and create something that is greater than some of the parts. You're, you're feeling the right feelings of like, oh my god, where is this going? No, I, I love the tricycle metaphor, that's great. But the, the book writer is the front wheel. They're the, one, they're the only ones attached to the steering. I want to thank all of our panelists for such wonderful insights.